Yeah, that's fine. I'm gonna okay, Ryan, you can see that? Yes, sir. Okay. Show me. All right, so sagittal uh, images of the cervical spine demonstrate a mass uh, posterior to the fourth and fifth vertebral bodies um, crossing, uh, coming out of the neural foramen on those parasagittal images. So I guess schwannoma and neurofibroma would be the typical differential. Okay. These were post-contrast uh, images? Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, two sagittal images, uh, again demonstrating a mass uh, posterior to the mid-cervical vertebral bodies. Uh, looks extramedullary, uh, similar differential, uh, schwannoma, neurofibroma, hemangioma, uh, drop mats. Uh, it's going out to the neural foramina, so uh, neural, they're, multi uh, they're bilateral, uh, so neurofibroma would be more likely possibility. Yeah. Yeah, it's involving the brachial plexus there. So, uh, yeah, neurofibroma work. Yeah, neurofibromatosis. Okay. <laughs> right. And those big ones. Yeah. Yeah, this looks like, right? T1 pre and post. Yeah, right there, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. What's neurofibromatosis one and two? Uh, let's see, uh, I have to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 12, 12 year old with neck pain. <laughs> so, uh, so there's a lot, uh, there's a large, uh, extraaxial mass extending through the uh, left foramina. And the foramen widened. With widening. So it's going to be chronic disease. Yeah. You need to repeat it because they can't hear me on the microphone. Oh, the foramen is, uh, is uh, widened, so it looks like it's chronic disease. And so that's a post scat image, so it looks like there's some enhancement as well. It's uniform enhancement. Uniform enhancement. Um, so that just shows that it's kind of extending through a couple of contiguous. Uh, uh, well, so there are a couple of them. So this could be, this is probably like another uh, optic glioma. Yeah, acoustic neuroma or vestibular schwannoma. Okay, okay. So, so neurofibromatosis two primarily affects the neural coverings. It's autosomal dominant. As therefore, it tends to affect first degree relatives. Uh, if you see bilateral eighth nerve schwannomas, it's pretty. It's almost pathognomonic of uh, neurofibromatosis two. Uh, unilateral sh uh, acoustic nerve schwannoma in someone under 30 is, is almost diagnostic as well. And then you look for the other uh, cover uh, neural covering tumors elsewhere, which we've seen quite a few of them in, in these, these examples. So this would be a case of typical neurofibromatosis too. Uh, Brian? All right, 17 year old male, uh, low back pain. We see an ovoid uh, extra axial, uh, extra dural mass, uh, ISO intense on T1. Uh, and it looks like there's partial extension into the uh, intradural space. Um, and it's displacing the cord anteriorly. Um, so this could be a, uh, again, a neurofibroma. As we'll see, also there are the examples of plexiform tend to be more infiltrative type lesions, and they can become quite large, and they often have kind of finger-like uh, stromal tissues extending into them, unlike other neurofibroma, which are more uniform. Uh, and so going to see. Uh, Eric? Oh, I thought I could see. I thought okay, 24-year-old um, <coughs> female, mass, mass uh, in the upper silhouetting the upper right medial stinum, possibly in the upper thoracic cavity. Um, 
and we've got MR images also showing a fairly extensive soft tissue mass uh, abutting the, the paraspinal, uh, abutting the spine and multiple levels, um, some heterogeneity, and uh, T2-weighted images, also some intermediate to high signal, solid appearing, and uh, pretty extensive on the uh, sagittals. Possibly a primitive neural tumor. <laughs> <such> as, uh, <laughs> Thank you. And there's several of these. This was large. This was a ganglioneuroma, uh, average age 10, uh, with a typical whirling type pattern. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Shobi? Okay, so uh, parasagal images in the cervical spine demonstrate a. Okay, a, on the right, um, near the right exiting nerve root of that level, anterior to it, a um, ISO to hyperintensity 1 and hyperintensity 2, or is that post contrast uh, lesion um, along the nerve root? So, all right, Horner syndrome. So, let's say uh, affecting the parasympathetic chain, I mean the sympathetic. Yeah, but what's Horner syndrome? Um, that's when you have. Um, is it uh, meiosis, ptosis, and um, something, one other thing? Anhydrous. Anhydrous. Okay. okay. And uh, what's, what, what's it generally affecting? Uh, I think it's basically where you... Where the you third. Was it third? Yeah. Is it uh, third cranial nerve? Okay. Uh, anyway. Hmm. And then this was a... And, and uh, this was a neural tumor. Before we go further, Philip had a, uh, uh, was going to tell us about the treatment of eosinophilic granuloma. Okay. So uh, I looked up a couple, of, well, I looked up one paper and one, uh, uh, another online article, and it, they said that um, the treatment is conservative. Um, in skeletally immature patients, you just leave it alone and it, it, it'll go away. Um, it's, uh, particularly involving the spine, but there's one paper that um, uh, they um, they followed up uh, uh, surgically resected EGs, and those actually had a higher incidence of recurrence. So, um, and they also suspected that there was a uh, increased uh, incidence of recurrence in uh, patients that were skeletal skeletally mature. So, uh, in a skeletal immature patient, and in that case that we saw with the vertebra plana, the, the best thing to do would be to do nothing um, or to biopsy it to confirm it but after you confirm it then. And that the, the, the vertebral body can regrow about half its size, surprisingly, and that uh, generally it's kind of low grade chemotherapy or radiation therapy if, if needed in some ways. Um, Paresthesia is for one week, 50-year-old uh, female, uh, sagittal images of the, of the thoracic spine. Um, uh, there is, yeah, um, like a long uh, low T1, and let me just see, um, it's low on T2 as well, um, and non, or marginally enhancing uh, mass-like lesion that is uh, pressing the cord posteriorly. Um, and we see the same findings on the axial images. Um, uh, it is extra medullary. Um, this could be, it, it could be a mass, it could be an infectious process. Uh, uh, okay. Not calcified. Not calcified, the bones look okay. Hypertrophic spinal pachymeningitis, okay. Yeah, it was long, so could be meningeal. <laughs> okay, so a um, couple of sagittal images through the T spine demonstrating. There's kind of a destructive process involving the vertebral body and kind of going circumferentially around uh, and to affect the posterior elements. 
and it's low on T2 and kind of ISO on T1. Um, so I'd be worried about, okay, so then here we have a better look at it. And it's kind of affecting the, uh, extending into the paraspinal muscles also, the right, the right paraspinal muscles. So I've been concerned about an infectious process, um, like, uh, something like a, a osteomyelitis or, or a TB or, um, Masses, okay. Lymphoma, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah this, I guess it could be a kind of a chronic infection. With TB, you would tend to get more fluid rather than solid mass like this. Uh, atypical mycobacteria also would be that way. I guess it could be some chronic fungal type thing. Actinomycosis could potentially look like this. But uh, it really looks more like a, a mass. And whenever you get a mass that really kind of breaks the normal rules and looks unusual and kind of extends across soft tissue planes and so forth, you always have to think of lymphoma. Uh, so Dr. If it, Cruz? Yes. Um, the really markedly low T2 signal on this, does yes. that exclude a lot of these processes? Because uh, I don't remember where I heard in board reviews that, t that lymphoma kind of tends to be low on uh, T2. I mean, I've seen it bright sometimes, but does that help out at all? Or, I mean, can you get chronic actinomycosis and TB that are really dark on T2, like on some of the other images? Uh, this degree of low signal intensity, uh, I don't think is all that all that really helpful. I think a lot of lesions uh, can be relatively low on T2, especially if they're chronic. You know, it would be maybe a little bit less likely for aggressive neoplasms, uh, but I think all of these chronic, more indolent infections can be, can be that way. Certainly, actinomycosis will. We've already seen some when we when we talked about infections of the foot, and they can be low and very low in signal intensity. Uh, certainly, lymphoma is the masquerader that everything. So, in a lesion like this. That's what you have to put in there. I think it's, this would be very atypical for a hemangioma. And we, we saw a bunch of other hemangiomas yesterday. And that's the other lesion that can kind of go along soft tissue planes like this and go to multiple levels that you'd have to think about. But the signal characteristics here are, would be atypical for that. Usually it has some fat in it. Usually you see more flow voids. You see a lot more signal homogeneity in it. So I think all of those, these, all of these findings we're talking about, as, as well as the large and homogeneous mass that we see here in this particular case, would really put this in that unusual category that lymphoma tends to be something you always have to think about. But again, uh, many, many of these lesions really, as far as MR is concerned, can look similarly. And there's a lot of atypical MR findings and, and all of these masses. Okay, but I think that that's a good thought, uh, Brian. So spinal lymphoma, a few things here from Dr. Sue. Uh, and again, it really tends to go everywhere. And uh, the inhomogeneity is pretty typical of spinal lymphoma. Okay, let's see, uh, Eric, three-year-old female. Left inguinal and buttock pain, progressive motor weakness of left lower limb. <coughs> and uh, we have an axial CT slice to the thoracic spine and uh, multiple slices. <coughs> there is today, uh, there's some soft tissue thickening posterior spinal canal um, on multiple slices, uh, possibly extending through the foramina. So some type of uh, some type of dural or certainly something in the spinal canal, uh, possibly a meningitis infection, um, and it's continuing at multiple levels, getting thicker. <laughs> <laughs> I'd forgotten there were so many slices here. I apologize for this. <laughs> Pretty extensive, multiple levels. Uh, <laughs> Subtle. I, I think I can remove a few of these <laughs> in the future. 
Whoops. And one foot on one hook. I went too far. So there you can really see it you know, on, the, on the MR, uh, the inhomogeneity, and this was a Burkett's lymphoma. So again, that kind of epidural disease that extends, now you can certainly get metastatic lesions to the, uh, to the, uh, to the dural and epidural spaces. They tend to be more nodular. Lymphoma tends to be more of a contiguous spread like we're seeing, like we're seeing in this particular case. So it's 9% of uh, epidural spinal tumors. That is uh, lymphomas, Burkett's is, it would be a small, uh, un uncommon form in this area, imaging findings, and we've already talked a little bit about those. Burkett's being a little bit more homogeneous than the others. So when we talk about intradural spinal lesions, you can divide them into intramedullary and extramedullary. So if it looks like it's really within the, in the cord, in adults, you think of ependymoma. In children, you think of astrocytomas uh, and hemangioblastomas, and then think of von hippel landau disease. Then you can also get multiple sclerosis, which can be mass-like at times. Uh, Syringohydromyelia, we've already seen examples of those, but we'll see some more here. And then there are a bunch of less common ones. For the extramedullary intradural lesions, it's schwann schwannoma, meningioma, neurofibroma, and perigliangliomas. So we can go and talk a little bit about or see some cases of syringal my, my, myelia. Whenever you see it for the first time, it can either be benign, typically due to dural uh, 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 fibrous tissue from either often from prior infectious disease, which uh, interrupts the normal CSF flow pattern leads to increased pressures in the spinal area because the, uh, you block the cerebral spinal fluid going back up to be absorbed uh, in the, uh, in the vent ventricular system, and that can back up and cause uh, syringohydromyelia. And then, but you always have to be concerned about a neoplasm. So the first diagnosis, you always have to make sure you get contrast images uh, to determine whether or not there's a neoplasm. If so, uh, uh, be able to uh, determine the full extent of, of the disease. Again, hydromyelia uh, is really enlargement of the central canal. Uh, sing syringomyelia is really extending into the actual structure of the brain, uh, typically with, uh, uh, with the destruction of some of the neurons. In uh, medical terms, they tend to be combined together in this syringohydromyelia uh, <clears throat> rather than trying to differentiate whether it's just enlargement of the central canal or whether it's actually extending through the uh, wall of the central canal into the surrounding tissues. So uh, let's see. I think Shobi, you're next. So uh, sagittal T1, T2. Um, Images of the cervical spine demonstrate narrowing at C23 and below that level, enlargement of the central canal within the uh, uh, spinal cord. And then, uh, yeah, kind of heterogeneous signal, a little bit lower, probably just abnormal flow within the uh, central canal. So I, I think the image on the left is high up in the cervical spine and lower down in the thoracic on the right. Okay, serious. Uh, the disc protrusion causing a syrinx? Yes, I think that was obstruction due to the chronic uh, disc disease, which produced it there. It ended up being no neoplasm in that particular case. Okay. Uh, sagittal image of the cervical spine uh, demonstrating a syrinx. Uh, also looks like the cerebellar tonsils are a little bit low-lying, are quite a bit low-lying. Um, so be concerned about an Arnold Chiari malformation. There you can see the central uh, enlargement. And here's just another example of our all Chiari type one. Uh, a Chiari malformation with the tonsils extending inferiorly here, uh, producing increased uh, obstruction in this, in this area, uh, leading to the, the syrinx. Uh, Philip. Uh, 
sure what part of the body this is. Is this like some oblique, a weird oblique sequence? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> oh, pull the fast one. <laughs> There's lysencephaly. What we want to know is what breed is this? <laughs> that looks like a, uh, a uh, Maurice. <laughs> Brian. All right, so we have uh, multiple sequences here that are bright on um, T2, low on T1, and it looks like there's some enhancement uh, post-contrast. So with the associated syrinx, uh, what differential is ependymoma or cuspospectoma? Yeah, and this, this was a glioma with an adjacent, uh, and this was in an older individual, as you can see here, and was a glioma. Uh, Eric. Neck pain, multiple cervical images. Uh, there's an enlargement of the cord at about the C4-5 level with increased signal uh, eccentric to the left on the axials, and we don't have a gap. But certainly here we have a, an enhancing nodule. Uh, so you think about glioma again. Show me. All right. Uh, multiple sagittal images demonstrate a uh, mass uh, within the sp um, spinal canal. Uh, with heterogeneous signal extending all the way up into the brain stem. Um, that T2 demonstrates what look like maybe cystic areas, and then that's a post-contrast on the right demonstrating uh, avid enhancement. So it's a glioma. Um, sagittal images and anaxial images of the uh, upper thoracic spine, uh, high T2 signal within the cord, uh, looks like a syrinx there. Uh, this is still a T2 image. Uh, I would like to see post-CAD. Um, uh, okay, so more. That's just a syrinx? Okay. Okay, so then uh, these are... Um, multiple sagittal images and it looks like they're so then we have a t2 t1 and t1 post um and there are a lot of tortuous uh a ser serpentine uh, like tubular structures along the i'm not sure that's extra dural or intradural but um I'd be worried about like a some vascular malformation or a dural ABF or something. Looks awful mass like. Are you so tubular? Okay. It looks like it's compressing the cord. Uh, so it was an astrocytoma. This is actually a cord mass, even though it almost looks like it's really uh, an extra medullary. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. A lot of astrocytomas, especially in the brain stem, as well as the cord, can actually uh, sometimes appear as though they're extramedullary when they're actually not at uh, histology. Uh, Brian. All right, 40 uh, year old female. <laughs> Neck pain after a um, Looks like that's anything obvious right away. So we have. Uh, CT images showing a heterogeneous signal within the uh, CT vertebra. Oh, I <laughs> no chance. Um, so differential here, I'm getting a lot of reverb. Is um, that better? Yeah, that's better. Um, this, it kind of looks like a, uh, oh, let's go there again. Um, so let's say patent's disease on most, but it's kind of a medial location. Uh, intraosseous mass. So the bar is low, heterogeneous at low, T1 and T2. Um, it's bright on, it's enhancing post contrast, so I have to think it's bright on this. Uh, metastasis. Um, patents would be really weird, but I would consider it. Gosh. 
I think you were kind of moving in that direction at the beginning, so I think that's good if we go back. Oops, I went the wrong direction. Yeah, yeah this kind of heter very heterogeneous, better, very heterogeneous, but, but with this, it really doesn't look aggressive. It doesn't look like it's really destroying the cortex, uh, and we've got a lot of fat within the lesion itself. And as we've seen, there aren't very many bone neoplasms that have fat within them. Certainly, the more aggressive malignant ones that destroy bone don't have fat in them. So whenever we see it looks like areas of calcification and fat, there are a lot of just a discombobulated group of normal elements in it. So I think your first thought that it was along the line of, uh, of a more of a benign type uh, lesion was a good one. Can you go to the fat? Oh, I'm sorry. So I think this is a T1 weighted image down here, and I think this is all fat here. This is the C2 vertebral body, and this is where you have the destruction on the CT scan. So fibrous dysplasia will have fat in it? It can. It has normal bone elements in it. They're just an ab they're abnormally distributed. The, their architecture is abnormal. I thought it was abnormal fibrous tissue in the... You can, have fi you can have any of the normal bone elements. You can have a lot of fibrous tissue or very little fibrous tissue. So it's, it's really n normal benign uh, tissue that you would see in a bone. It's just that it's disorganized. It doesn't have a normal bony organization. Okay. It's going to be polyostatic or monoostatic. And then again, it's just very heterogeneous, but essentially it's basically normal elements that are uh, just put in abnormally. And the differential diagnosis can be pretty broad. Uh, Paget's disease, bone, uh, bone cysts, osteoblastoma, if it's the right location and right age group. Okay, Eric. Okay, 40-year-old male. Um, I'm getting quite a bit of reverb as well. C3, there's some uh, height loss and uh, abnormal signal in the vertebral body. Are you still it's getting better. reverb? No, it's, it's better now. Thanks. Also, some expansion um, enlargement and on the uh, axials and on the CT. Looks like sort of diffuse osseous uh, enlargement or expansion. I would also wonder about something like fibrous dysplasia again in this setting. Good thing to wonder about. Okay, a 30-year-old female with neck pain. So C2 and C3, uh, um, the posterior elements kind of just look more a little moth-eaten. There's a multiple lucencies uh, within both of those posterior elements. Okay, so that's in 06. Yeah, um, biopsy negative. Now uh, 2011. The uh, MRI demonstrates heterogeneous increased signal intensity on T1 and T2 and um, within the vertebral bodies and posterior elements of multiple... Uh, so it's involving multiple vertebra, but doesn't seem to be extending between them. No. Yeah, it's just diffusely increased in signal intensity. Cystic angiomatosis. <laughs> that was 18th on my differential. <laughs> Palpable mass in the skull uh, in a 19-year-old female. Uh, so there is a lucency in the frontal region there uh, with surrounding sclerosis. Uh, this could looks like a b uh, benign uh, kind of a lesion. Uh, Okay, could be a fibrous dysplasia. Uh, also, would consider, yeah, fibrous dysplasia. Okay. And it has here. You can almost see a ground glass type yeah. appearance to it. Right. Yeah, Why don't you say that? Oh, yeah, there is ground glass appearance that. <laughs> and the cortex is intact. Right. There's no periosteal reaction. Okay. <laughs> no uh, periosteal reaction, and the cortex is intact, so <laughs> that makes it benign. <laughs> Prior one with a neck, why why was the biopsy negative yeah. on the up to the X-ray? No six. 
It's 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 a vascular type lesion, so they probably got blood out oh, okay. rather than any diagnostic tissue. Okay. differential diagnostic uh, things in, in lesions like this. Certainly, in a, especially in a young person, eosinophilic granuloma would be something you always think about in, in these kind of things. Could be chronic osteomyelitis, but it really didn't have quite the same picture. Chronic used, used to get more of a, a, a irregular ossification in it, and the acute form, the bone's usually much more indistinct with more of a moth-eaten pattern, and you don't have that kind of expansion. Uh, and it really didn't look cystic. You could have an ABC, that would be an unusual location for it. As we'll show later on, you can get solid ABCs, but they're very unusual. Okay, Philip. So uh, these are radiographs, um, a frontal and oblique radiographs through the cervical spine demonstrating kind of like a, a destructive process involving the posterior elements of the, uh, in the cervical spine. So. Uh, in the facet, in the right facet joint, um, there's prom, and those look like erosions, some chondral cysts with some vacuum phenomenon. Um, uh, so here we have, uh, yeah, it's kind of like a, there's a soft tissue process going on too, kind of uh, extending into the uh, facets. Um, so in a 14 year old, be thinking about maybe uh, uh, lymphoma or EG. Right. Or it always links about lymphoma, but what in what in this makes you think of lymphoma at the top of your list? Uh, that there's soft tissue mass and there's destruction of the involving bones. Yeah. Okay, but but that's not really that characteristic of lymphoma. But but uh, lymphoma, you certainly can. But as we saw in a lot of those cases with lymphoma, you often had a long mass and you'd get kind of an infiltrative type involvement of the bone with replacement of the marrow space rather than the cystic changes in this hypertrophic bone. This almost looks like degenerative disease here. Uh, but, but whenever you think about the posterior elements of the spine, there are a couple of tumors that just seem to like that area. And they're, you know, Osteochondroma, osteoid osteoma, and aneurysma bone cyst. Those are the kind of three that should come to the top of your mind, and then, then you think about other things. So, in the osteochondromas that affect the posterior elements, are they your typical exostoses, or do they look kind of random like this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, because they're in areas where there's a lot of stress in joints and so forth, they can look bizarre. But we'll see more bizarre-looking ones later, when we get into the. the there, there. When you look at osteochondroma, there, there's a category of about six or seven types that we we'll, we'll talk about later. What else would be your differential in this case besides? Uh, I mean, could this be anything other than a neoplastic process? Yeah, I think it could also be prior trauma, and you have degenerative disease with scarring around the area of the trauma. Like yeah, like an old jump facet or something. Right. Uh, Brian? All right, so we have an uh, off main line image of the uh, cervical spine showing an expansion of bone, bone with uh, high signal uh, on the gradients, uniformly dark. Um, T2 is more heterogeneous. Oh, by the way, for those interested, this is a narrow uh, foramen. Yeah. Okay, uh, Eric, this is a subtle case. Yeah, this is a, <coughs> a hard lump which appears to arise from C2. It's a nice process, maybe C3 as well as sporadic. And uh, maybe we don't need to do any axials or anything on it. Okay. Um, very sporadic and uh, a dense osseous mass. So you think about things like um, uh, osteoma or malaria stasis. 
All right, 24-year-old male back pain, uh, progressive for two years, tenderness from T6 uh, to 8 level, unremarkable history. Sorry, bone scan shows a focal area of uptake in the mid-thoracic spine. CT shows a destructive process in the uh, lamina uh, near the origin of the spinous process. Um, again, uh, MRI shows a destructive mass lesion. Um, within the bones, it's kind of uh, ISO on T1, low on T2, and it's post contrast. Okay, osteoblastoma. Hmm, okay. Why is it so destructive? An osteoblastoma? Because isn't there there's supposed to be a nidus and then you get surrounding periosteal reaction, but it's like it kind of blew out the an osteoblastoma. Osteoblastoma is a benign. Uh, osseous tumor that has immature uh, cells in it. I mean, it's not, a, it's not an osteoidosteoma. Is that what you're thinking of with the nidus? I thought an osteoblastoma was like a bigger osteoidosteoma. That's, it, that's what they call it. They say a, a big osteoidosteoma if, if it's over two centimeters. Uh, and the, 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 uh, the tissue characteristics are very similar, but you don't tend to get, you don't, you don't get niduses in an osteoblastoma. They're bigger. They're probably different processes, but some people think they just might be more kind of a chronic process of an osteoidosteoma. But most osteoidosteomas, they really involute over time. They don't really get larger. Yeah. So it's probably a different, a different process. And you tend to get a little bit of expansion and destruction of the bone. And the posterior elements of the spine is a place that they like to, like to grow. So this one really didn't have any sclerosis or what amounted to calcification or laying down of that's no right. Bone. Yeah, usually you see a little bit more bone formation. Right. But, but again, these are immature lesions That's so that they can be very variable. Okay, a uh, 20 year old male with neck pain for several months. There is an arrow pointing to one of the uh, pedicles. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. It moves. <laughs> it moves. It's the mud. <laughs> I was like, I don't see anything. Uh, <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so one of the vertebral bodies has low T1 and high T2 signal. Uh, it ex extends to the posterior elements, I thought. I don't really see it still. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, there it is, uh, involving the right side of the vertebral body. Uh, um, so again, it, so this is the initial study. Um, uh, based on this, it could be uh, could be anything really, uh, but it's not very destructive and it's small. Uh, yeah, it's. Yeah. <laughs> but, but in this, this in is this a great condition. location for metastatic disease right. because this is right where the. The, the capillaries tend to get smaller, and so if you have spread coming in the base, the base plexus back here, then uh, in this location over near the, uh, the, the pedicles is where you tend to get early involvement of metastatic disease. But I, I wouldn't show you a metastatic case, <laughs> or, or rarely. Yeah. Okay. So 16 months later, um I still don't see it, but yeah, <laughs> not sure if I will call that, but there is some irregularity there. Um, okay, it looks it looks more infiltrative um, and maybe involving the lower vertebral body as well. So it's involving two contiguous vertebral bodies, but the disc looks okay, um, um, and in. Involving the posterior elements, uh, not that much soft tissue. Uh, there is some soft tissue mass around it, so it could be a metastatic process. It could be something benign. Um, could be an osteochondroma, one of those bizarre ones. Um, could be an osteoblastoma with osteoid formation. Could be an aneurysmal bone cyst. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have. We have. Um, uh, 
lateral view of the cervical spine demonstrating it looks like there's an expansile destructive process involving C2. Um, all right, so we have a couple of MR images uh, showing um, it's kind of a dark uh, hypo intense on you know, it's hypo intense on T2 and it's, ex it's still expansile and it's completely expanded the C2 dens and the inferior end plate with the posterior displacement of the cord. So post-scat images demonstrate enhancement. Um, there's, yeah. So these are CT images, uh, again, demonstrating a central, like, lucent lesion. Uh, okay. Giant cell tumor. Okay, Brian. All right, multiple uh, images of the looks like uh, lower thoracic or femoral part of the spine showing a partial collapse of vertebral body associated with soft tissue mass, which is enhancing lytic. Oh, shit. And it's giant cell tumor. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, yeah, gi another, another giant cell tumor. Getting there. And again, I, I, I really don't know any good criteria to, to differentiate these. I think just the see, except for the biopsy. Yeah, the, that, posterior, yep. that posterior vertebral cortex is bowing out, which, which you typically, you know, uh, consider more of a malignant process to cause? Yes. Yeah, I think this really, this is clearly a malignant process. Okay. Yeah. One, and as you're saying, if you're looking at compression fractures, I think uh, later in, I think later somewhere here, maybe it's even in the lumbar spine section, we'll talk about different papers that show the criteria to look for to try to differentiate uh, osteoporotic from uh, malignant compression fractures. And as you were saying, this is very typical. The bowing, posterior bowing of the cortex is a very good sign for malignant involvement. When you have uh, osteoporosis, the posterior cortex tends to be maintained to the end, more or less, and you get an anterior collapse. Uh, with, uh, when you maintain straight or sometimes a little bit angulated uh, posterior cortex of the vertebral body. Whereas tumor tends to eat away over time uh, the bone inside, it gradually weakens and you get more of the posterior bowing like this. So this uh, also, you have complete involvement of the uh, vertebral body here and then obviously when you see the soft tissue mass extending out into the soft tissues, then it, then it kind of uh, uh, nails, nails the, the coffin head in. Uh, but so that's, uh, this is very characteristic of a malignant uh, compression injury, right? Uh, Pratima? Okay, uh, in the right upper lung, there is a big mass uh, that demonstrates. It's like Eric's lesion. Yeah, it looks like Eric's lesion, right? Uh, it has some uptake. There's an uptake in the upper vertebral bodies there. So something arising from the bone. Uh, Destructive process involving the upper thoracic vertebral bodies could be a giant cell tumor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a meth here. Yeah. Typically, in this location with that finding, you'd think about a benign neurotumor extending in there, like we saw before, but uh, other things can do. So this is a chest x-ray. So uh, we have a frontal view of the chest and um, can't really see the spine. In the right hilum, there's kind of soft tissue prominence. Um, okay. <laughs> so next, uh, <laughs> overlying the <laughs> right hilum, there's a, there's a density. <laughs> This isn't a, a lung lecture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so there's an expansile mass, and presumably arising. It's centered at, at the costochondral junction of the uh, whatever anterior rib that is, um, and it's expansile, and it's a, it demonstrates increased markedly increased uptake on the. Uh, uh, 
on the uh, bone scan, so it's a plasma cytoma. Ryan. A uh, three-year-old female with mass in the uh, thoracic wall. Um, it's got some heterogeneity enhancement to it. It's uh, three years of age. Uh, ultrasound shows that the gut's low. At this age, I wouldn't have said no. This is juxtarticular. Cystic. Yeah, this is kind of pretty non-specific. So, it's five. Right? <laughs> okay, Eric. Thirty-seven-year-old male, back mass, one year. There's some uh, superficial soft tissue thickening, uh, increased signal, left parasympinal, and the histology. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tough case. <laughs> uh, let's see. Why don't we stop here, and we'll we'll start up here. And again, I, this is more just to see a lot of masses with known diagnoses, and uh, there is clearly something you're going to have to biopsy a mass like that, and it turned out to be and. Uh, uh, fibrosarcomas or fibrohistiocytomas are, are very common lesions in the elderly in, in, in that location. But again, MR is not specific. Okay, so thanks everyone. Thanks, Dr. And I'll see tomorrow's Friday. Uh, no, tomorrow's, tomorrow's Thursday, Thursday, right? Yeah. Oh, Friday we won't have a lecture. Uh, so tomorrow we'll we'll have a lecture or a class, and then uh, then we'll skip a uh, a week and start a uh, week after next. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you. Yep.